much to say that insofar as I'm able to adduce the premise from the conclusion, I recognize the difference, the transformation from the premise and the conclusion. I am not stating the same thing. This is a proof, and this is what this is saying, right? This is a proof. This, satisfy, this satisfies one of the three conditions for proof, according to Moore, because my premise is different from my, that's the simplest way to say it, right? Because my premise is different from my conclusion. I am not constructing a tautological argument. Some people, he's anticipating an objection from a hypothetical objector, and the objector says, really what this is is um, a demonstration of tautology, a demonstration which has not has not, um, has not um, led to anything of distinction from what was already given in your premise. And he wants to say that that is false. I have done something, I have done something that is not tautological. What has been performatively demonstrated in my premise, left hand, is not the same thing that has been derived in my arrived derived from in uh, in my conclusion right i haven't derived it in my conclusion which is this is the left hand of a human or there are two human hands right um so there's something different there and that's important the question then becomes and i don't want to jump ahead but if you can understand that that the question then becomes how did he do that how did we get from how do we get this new thing how do we get this transformation i'll talk about that in a little bit again very very relatively small um I mean, it's, it's two or three sentences. Very, very relatively small and rather seemingly mundane um, argument structure. But as we start to analyze it now, we start to see that there's so much complexity built into this. And this is why it's perfect for pedagogical purposes, right? So um, if, for example, the premise is A and the conclusion is A, then the truth of the proof, this is all me, then the truth of the proof is rooted in the identity of A. This is what he does not want to do. That is, A is A, which is tautological, but the fact that there is a difference, right, he wants a difference. The fact that there is a difference between the premise and the conclusion requires more to demonstrate, I love this, right, requires more to demonstrate how this difference serves as proof, right, that's, it, 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 trust me, to write that sentence took me about, I'm not going to exaggerate, but it probably took me about 10 minutes to write the sentence. Right? It's a very difficult sentence. You wouldn't think that this is a complex sentence, but me writing the sentence to explain it, it's, it's, it's not easy, right? I'll read it again so that I can do this and show you uh, why this is significant. First, let's read Moore. Moore says, Unless the premise which I adduced as proof of the conclusion was different from the conclusion I adduced it to prove. Very, very difficult to understand. My clarification of what that means and also its significance, epistemologically speaking, um, this is the, the last sentence in uh, 1A. The fact that there is a difference between the premise and the conclusion, two human hands exist here now, requires that distinction, the distinction that there is difference, forces more or anyone to demonstrate how, how this difference serves as proof. It causes me to have to disjiculate my body. I have to as part of creating and legitimizing the difference, I have to say that here is my right hand. My right hand is here. The fact that I say here is my right hand and I wave my right hand and I say here and I, and I say now, it is a requirement, not internally, to the subject. <laughs> this is what's important. <laughs> it's not an internal requirement. It's not a subjective requirement. Right? That's absolutely critical. It is not a subjective requirement that I decide either to or not to demonstrate. It is an objective requirement. It is a requirement of logic itself. Logic. Not as personified, right? I don't want people to think in terms of personification. But logic, the logic, and this, is, this would, be, it would be actually pretty interesting to formalize this, right? But and this epistemic as well, right? This epistemic account, my understanding of my own knowledge, right? Account isn't rooted, the demonstration isn't rooted in my subjectivity. The demonstration is a requirement of the external consistency of the logic that I have to, I have to demonstrate. Okay, here is, here is, this is my premise, right? Here is my right hand, here is my left hand, premise is done. Now I arrive at the conclusion. 
and his conclusion is two human hands exist. The fact that my conclusion is legitimized and is also different from my premise is only facilitated, is only facilitated by the fact that I demonstrated it. it were I not to have demonstrated this, right? Were more, not to have demonstrated and say, here now, this me, my hand, right hand. <laughs> were, he, were he not to have demonstrated, were he not to have performed it, there wouldn't have, if I said, this is a human hand, this is a human hand, therefore I have two, two human hands, it would have been tautological and it would have been true, but it would have been meaningless. What he does is, and this is absolutely important, this is absolutely critical, is that he imbues, rather geniusly, extremely geniusly, right? He imbues his argument with meaning via performative demonstration. That's key. He imbues his argument with meaning via performative demonstration. This is why I live my life. This is how I live my life. For me as a philosopher, there isn't any meaning in our actions in the world. I'm going to take this on another level for a little bit. There isn't any meaning in our actions in the world unless we recognize that the actions that we do, even the most mundane act that we do, is imbued with meaning insofar as we are demonstrating ability. Right? We're demonstrating understanding. We're demonstrating our capacity. We're demonstrating. It's a demonstration. Demonstration, the proof, and this is it, right? The proof is in the pudding. That phrase, that adage is, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the demonstration. Right? It's not soup, it's pudding. If you don't believe me, take a bite. Feel the texture. The consistency is different. Is different. Right? Performative demonstration is a response then, and this performative demonstration is a response then in two senses. Now I have to, I do have to actually take it. Um, do I want to go there? I, I didn't anticipate doing this, but I have to go there because it just clicked. Um, oh, okay. Just really quick. We have the rationalist and we have the empiricist. It's very, very important to know um, two key figures which Moore is really addressing, right? The first is Descartes, obviously, right? The first is Descartes as a rationalist, but he's also addressing Berkeley, right? Bishop George Berkeley, right? So he's addressing both Descartes and Berkeley. Descartes and Berkeley are surprisingly, I don't, I have to do this so to make sense of this performative demonstration, right? It's, it's that important, right? The performative demonstration is that important, right? This is why my lecture series, for me, are, in a Heideggerian sense, acts, a demonstration of work, right? I, hopefully it does artistic, but I don't want to get too far off hand. What we have from the transformation from the rationalist to the empiricist are two different ways of epistemologically describing and coming to know external reality, metaphysics, right? Metaphysics is wed with epistemology. The rationalists say that what is, is a condition of my mind. So that we have mind-dependent external reality, right? The external world is, in any various number of ways, mind-independent. The empiricists want to talk about external reality and the objectivity of external reality, but they don't want it to be, they don't want it to be a condition, our knowledge of external reality, um, which is something self-referential in the sense that there has to be empirical verification or validation of external uh, existence. Right? So this is sort of the, the sort of you know, broad stroke distinction between um, rationalists and empiricists. Every you know, intro to philosophy student hopefully knows this. Uh, and, and more other professors will go into it in more detail. I don't have the time here to go into that because I'm, I'm trying to show you why performative demonstration is as important as it, as it is. We've recognized how he is already critiquing Descartes' methodological skepticism because Descartes denies the external world only to arrive at the cogito, but when he reconstructs the external world, it is a consequence of his mind, right? So from, from the beginning of the argument with the evil genie to the, to the cogito is a deconstruction of the external world. That's all we need to know. Let's just focus on that. This first aspect.